Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Let me get down on my knees and pray because I need God. And before I get in trouble, I'm going to shut up. Stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, we haven't come into the house of God to hear from a man. We haven't come from the house of God to hear from a woman. We haven't come to hear from a tall man, short man, black man, white man, brown man. No, no, Lord. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. We just love you so much. We're so grateful. And as you bless us tonight, Lord, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are brothers and our sisters. Bless them. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary chapels and Harvest and Valley and Oasis. We thank you, Father, for uh, the will, the, the well, the way, the, the Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist, Ecclesia, Foursquare, Assemblies of God, Catholic. Father, we thank you for Adventist brothers and sisters. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than them. We see ourselves co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, and that's yours. And we give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. With a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. I want you to take your Bible, go with me. I have absolutely no idea what part this is. We're just going to keep on going. We were going to try to squeeze it into four parts and then six parts and eight parts. But, you know, we're talking about marriage. Marriage is obviously a very important subject. Those of you that are not married, it might be that someday you're going to be married. So you need to know how important it is and you know, know, need to know what God expects from you. Those of you that are married, I don't care who you are, marriage can always get better. So you need to know what the principles are. And how you find this out to find out how marriage really works is to go to the author of marriage. If you're going to find out how marriage is supposed to handle it and how you're supposed to do it, then guess what? You need to go to one who created it, and that's God himself. And he gives us great insight in the scripture. There's eight commandments, remember, to the husband and four commandments to the wife. And uh, there's a lot of other things that he talks about, and that's what we're going to get into, some of the deeper aspects of it as we look at the word of the Lord. Is it okay with you that we're really not in a big hurry? Is it okay with you that we cover the subject so that someday you can have ref reference back to it? Even if you're not married, you know people that are married. And I promise you in this society of social system, I promise you even within the church you'll find people that are unhappily married. And you can minister to them if you know what it is that the Word of God says and what God expects. Remember we we're talking about a wonderful subject. And I tell you there's nothing better than a good marriage. Nothing worse than a bad marriage. But you make the choice on what the marriage is going to be like by what you and how you handle your part of what God says. The men do their part, all eight commandments, because God said it. Not because you feel like it or your wife acts a certain way and if she does this, then I'll do it. And wives, it's the same way with you. You have four commandments that God gives you, and you do them because God said for you to do them, not because your husband is good or nice or even deserving of you being that way. Yet at the same time, if you do your part and God does his part, it'll turn the husband around or the vice versa, turn the wife around, and uh, you'll find that marriage can be very successful, very happy, and very fulfilling as it's supposed to be. After all, it is a picture of Christ in the church, tells us that in the scripture. In other words, a marriage that is a Christian marriage ought to be a reflection of Jesus Christ and the church. The church being not the building, the church being people that are born of the Spirit of God. That's the church. And so someday there's a wedding feast, there's a wedding in heaven where we're all going to get out of here. Eastern sky is going to split, we're going to get out of this place. I don't know when, but thank God it's going to happen. 
And when it does, can I just say this to you? There's going to be a wedding feast in heaven. And you are, if you're born of the Spirit of God, if you're part of the church, you are called in Scripture the bride of Christ. And how he takes care of his church is exactly how the husband is to take care of the wife. And if you just do it that way, even though at times you'd be frustrated and don't want to do it that way, and that's why we start off in verse number 21 every week of the fifth chapter of Ephesians. It says this, verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. In other words, I do what I do because I fear God more than I think about myself. My feelings come second to what God says. Isn't that an interesting thought? Instead of it being my feelings that tell me how I do things, I do things according to what God says because I'm, I'm afraid of God. I, I reverence, respect God. Then he goes on to make this statement in verse 22. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body, verse 24. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, and so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. For he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, and having, not having spot nor wrinkle nor any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Verse 28. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own body, and he that loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished it and cherished it. Just as the Lord does the church. Just as the Lord does the church. Get the verse. Just as the Lord, verse 29, does the church. One more time. Just as the Lord does the church. And he goes on to say, verse number 30, For we are members of his body and his flesh and of his bone, verse 31, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to this. His wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself and let his wife see that she respects her husband. We've talked about a lot of this, but there's a lot we haven't talked about. I like this in verse, if you will, in verse number 29. It says, for one never yet hated his own flesh. A man doesn't hate his own flesh. But he does something. He nourishes it. We talked about that last week, so I'm not going to go there. But the next word that he says, he cherishes it. In other words, the commandment here for the husband is to cherish the wife, which is really a fascinating understanding. Sometimes, you know, we read the verses, we read the Bible, and we just kind of blow through them. We don't really meditate or think about them very much at all. But here's a commandment from God that says the husband's to cherish the wife. When someone hears that, they oftentimes don't even know, know what God is requesting of them. And that's what we're going to do today, is we're going to talk about that. To cherish means to treat as a precious, if you will, or valuable. To treat as precious, to treat as precious or valuable. And so here the husband is being commanded by God to treat the wife as something of great value. And if I could just say something to you, today... The attack is to get people, instead of to see each other as valuable, to see each other as very common and to start treating each other as common. I've taught you this many years ago. I don't know how long you've been in the church, but you know, even as far as 15, 18 years ago, we talked about a subject of what, what you treat as common will become common to you. Doesn't matter how great it is. Doesn't matter how wonderful. You can take God and his superiority and everything, his supreme uh, uh, elegance of everything and treat as common. It'll become common to you. And what you treat as common will become common. But what you treat as valuable will always stay valuable or precious to you. And oftentimes we don't realize that the attack is, is how we treat people and how we treat our wives or how we treat our husbands or how we treat our, our, our loved ones, our families and things like that. We, we start off with great reverence. We start off with great care. We start off with great value placed on people. But as we live together for a while, all of a sudden the value is gone and the habit takes its place. And we start communicating and feeling things about each other that are 
that are common, and it wasn't very long before the very one that excited you is no longer the one that excites you anymore. The very one that was thrilling to be around and could hardly wait to be around, could hardly wait to date, hardly wait to be around and see and talk to is no longer there at all. It's just someone you come home to, someone you burp in front of and all those other bodily functions that you do in front of each other and you treat them as common and all of a sudden because you treat them as common, they have become common instead of valuable. And one of the things God says, listen, if you're going to be married, husbands, you need to always see your wife as something of great great value that has precious to you. And if you're going to do that, there are some things that God shares with us in scripture about how to treat and keep on treating as valuable. And here I want to share with you four little simple principles so that we do not ever treat our wives as common. I can't tell you how many men will say things to me like, I really love my cars. I love my car so much that, you know, Pastor, uh, the wife can go, but the car is going to stay. And everybody laughs and thinks that's funny. Let me tell you something. That's not funny. That's a stupid statement. And it's a stupid statement that your heart, listen to me, hears. And your heart is being trained by what you're saying. And all of a sudden, you're going to find yourself in a place of polluting that which you were one time thought was valuable and precious. You're now going to come along and pollute it to the place where you consider the wife as something common. And when you consider the wife as something common, you have now broken what God told you to do. And oftentimes, we'll have people come in for counseling and say, I just don't understand what my wife, why did this happen? Why did this take place? What happened? All of a sudden, we were in love in one year, and then all of a sudden, there was nothing. There was, all of a sudden, she just turned off on me and left me. And guess what? It's because instead of you respecting, instead of you treating with value, you treat it as common, and all of a sudden, man, you blew it. And the same guy that says, oh, the car stays before my wife is the same guy that comes in bawling and squalling and counseling, by the way. So you might as well learn this before you find your feelings all defeated and stop treating people and things as common and start treating them with great, great uh, precious value. How to cherish four things. Number one, anything that I'm going to cherish, I'm going to consider as precious and valuable I'm going to protect. That's number one. I tell you what, if I had gold or silver or diamonds, and I don't, so if you ever decide to break into pastor's house, can I tell you something? You'll get nothing but cheap junk uh, jewelry. There's nothing there. Rolex watches, I'm sorry, not a chance. Timex maybe. <laughs> and they don't even work after a few years. And I just want you to know something, listen closely, but if I ever had diamonds and I ever had jewelry and I ever had gold and precious watches of some kind, I would at least do something to protect them. I, I, I one time bought a house, had a big safe in it. I never used the safe because I never had anything precious to put in it. The only thing that I had that was precious was Debbie and she wouldn't get in. And if I could just say this to you, you will always protect what you find to be valuable. And men, sometimes we stop protecting. And we just treat them as if they're there as baggage that are part of our life. and We don't protect them anymore. One of the things that's built in every single man is a directional thing. Have you ever noticed how women get lost except in the shopping center? I mean, you put Debbie in any shopping center in Southern California, she knows exactly where every store is at. Put her on the freeway, man. She's going to end up in San Diego or in San Francisco or someplace. She'd have no idea where she's at. She could drive out of the driveway and not know where she's at. But me, I know always where I'm at. You know why? Because it's part of my protection process. And on the inside, I know where I'm supposed to do in order to take my family where it needs to go and be safe. And it's just built on the inside of every one of us for protection. And without protection, my friends, we're really not going to make it. And what happens when you stop protecting is that you find yourself in a place where you're, oh my goodness, that you start treating as common. You need to fight to protect all the time to make sure. When Deborah is driving in the rain, I say, Deborah, why don't you park your car, drive with me, because I know she doesn't see very good. And I know that she doesn't even drive good when the sun's out. 
And so I'm making sure she's okay. Follow me. And then all of a sudden, that little white car goes shoop, right on by me. Like, what are you doing? I'm just having such a hard time because I'm trying to protect her. And oftentimes, girls, you need to let your husbands protect you. Not only is it fun, but it's good for the value system. You start to see you and treat you as valuable to you because you'll start to protect you. Malachi, third chapter, verse number 17 says this. I'll just pop these on the overhead. We've been in church a long time this week and I don't want to take too much time. So let's just look at them on the overhead. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, God speaking. On the day that I make them my jewels, listen to these words, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. In other words, I will spare them, meaning the things that might come their way, the troubles they might have, the pressures that they might be involved in, the trials that might come, I will spare them, but as a son that serves him. The word spares up there means this, he's wanting to protect. And if God wants us to protect our wives, we've got to have that same kind of an attitude. When you start to protect your wife, it means you start to think ahead for her. You start to see what it is she's going to be doing, how it's going to work. It isn't just about you, it's about her. It's about you protecting her at every area of her life. So important for us. In other words, we treat her as common and then we lose everything. Number two, we're talking about how to cherish. Number two is if you're going to protect, you're also going to have to provide. Our provision is very important here. Provision, providing, meeting the needs of somebody is, is really important. Making sure that they're kept in the right place and you provide for them the things that are essential. I mean, men, you can't come along and expect the wives to provide for you. When God has designed the man to provide for the woman, doesn't mean the wife can't have a great job. It doesn't mean the wife can't make more money. Nobody said anything about that. Doesn't mean the wife can't be greater in education. Doesn't mean anything about that. But there comes a time when you are the very source of provision. You are going to meet not just the economic needs, you're going to meet all the spiritual and physical needs of that person. Because without it, man, we fail. And you've got to provide, you've got to be there to make sure that you're there to take care of those needs. Because a lot of times people don't provide at all because they don't care. They've now what? Treated the wife or treated the husband as common. And whatever happens, who cares? I don't care about you. But I like what the Word of God says in Acts 20, chapter verse 28. You might as well write it down. And it says these words in Acts 20, chapter verse 28. Therefore take heed to yourself and to all of the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. Here he comes along, watch this. Listen to this. To shepherd the church of God. In the old King James, it says to feed the church of God. In other words, God is making sure that the church is taken care of. And just as the church is taken care of, the wife has got to be taken care of. And he's making a statement, make sure that you feed the flock of God. You can do a lot of things with the flock, but one of the things that are essential for their future is to make sure that they're fed properly. And I'm not talking about just giving your wife food. I'm talking about all the spiritual needs that a, ma- a woman may need, all the, uh, all the intention needs, all of the physical needs, all the other needs that are their emotional needs, support to take care of. You say, that's a big job. It's not such a big job if you're in tune and you're there as a provider. I like what it says, if you will, in Deuteronomy 32, verse number 10, it says, And he found him in the desert land and in the wasteland and hallowing the wilderness, and he enriched him and instructed him, and here's God, and kept him as the apple of his eye. Kept him. God finds his people and he keeps them. And if God finds his people and keeps them, we husbands have got to, when we find our wife, keep them and provide for them. That's what God would have. Fourth, third thing, excuse me, that God would have for us. Number one, protection. Number two, provision or provide. Number three is pleasure. What you are seeing is ought to be pleasurable to you. And I'll show you how to make it pleasurable. 
And a lot of times we don't see these things and we don't make them pleasurable. If I could take you back to that same verse, Deuteronomy 32, verse number 10, and it says this, pop it up on the overhead. The last part of the verse, after he makes this statement, he says he kept him, and he says these words, as the apple of his eye. In other words, God saw the people and said, man, I'm not only going to provide for them, I'm going to see them as beautiful. And seeing them with pleasure. When I see my Deborah... Doesn't matter if she has makeup on, doesn't matter if she's dressed, they're not dressed, doesn't matter if she's looking good, doesn't matter if she just got out of bed and her hair is sticking up all over the place, doesn't matter, doesn't matter one bit to me. She's the apple of my eye, she brings me pleasure. You say, well, Pastor Tim, how, how do you do that? I'm glad you asked. Point number four, very important because we're talking about a wonderful subject of cherishing, making them valuable. Number one was protection. Number two is provision. Number three is finding pleasure. And number four is proclaiming. If you can't proclaim out of your mouth your pleasures, then you're missing out what this is all about. I found this out the hard way because when I first got married with Debbie, she was very different from me. She did things different. She washed dishes different. The toilet paper was different. She cleaned the house different. I mean, I didn't like any part of it. I want her to do things my way. And I actually told God, I said, God, you need to change this woman. God changed me. And he said, the first thing we're going to change is your attitude about her. Start speaking pleasure over her. And sometimes, you know, Deborah will do things that, that will probably in some cases make some people real angry. I just find them funny. She cracks up the cars all the time and pops tires and runs over everything. She's, you know, she's kind of like Mr. Magoo's wife or something. She can't see anything. And, she, you know, she doesn't want to wear glasses because she doesn't look cool. And so she runs over and crashes into everything. And I, I just love her. She says, we just had an accident. And I just say, God, man, you are so funny. She says, that's not funny. I said, oh, it is funny. I watched you back out of the garage. You didn't even look back. My car was right behind you and crashed right into it. And she, I said to her, you are naturally funny. My, my statement to Debbie is, you're naturally, you don't realize how funny you are. How did you get so funny? Your mom and dad aren't funny. How did you get so funny? You are naturally funny. And she's going, I'm not funny. I'm not funny. Oh, yes, you're funny. To me, I laugh all the time. See, I am speaking my pleasures over her. And do you know what she has become to me? Funny? (laughs) I speak my pleasures. You're the most beautiful woman in the whole world. Do you know what she's become to me? The most beautiful woman in the whole world. I, I, I speak over her the things that I should be seeing in her. I speak over her. You're the smartest woman I know. You're the most spiritual woman. She really is the most spiritual person I know. But nevertheless, that was easy to speak over. She has such great attributes, and those are easy to speak over. But the other ones that are contrary to my personality, I speak those over too, and then I consider them to be funny. And I just say, you're just so great. You're so funny. I just love the way you do life. And guess what? I found out something when I start to say, I love the way you do life. I found out that I learned how to love the way she does life. And now I want to do life her way because she's funny and alive and exciting 
and motivating and spiritual and everything you can possibly think of. To me, she's the greatest mom, the greatest grandma, the greatest nana, the greatest wife. The gra Why do I say all those things? Because I speak them all the time. Isn't that what God says about his church? They're wonderful. They're my kids. They can do all things through Christ that strengthens them. I'm here for them. There's no closed doors against them. I'm not against them. I'm not here condemning them. I'm lifting them. I'm blessing them. I'm loving them. And that's how a husband ought to treat his wife. And can I say something? When you start to treat your wife by proclaiming the things that God says about her, you will start to feel it. But here's what most men do. I don't like her. She didn't do this. She didn't do that. She has this problem. She has that problem. She frustrates me. She and then you wonder why you treated her as common. Because the Bible says in James, salt water and fresh water can't come out of the same well. And what you speak is either going to be fresh water over your wife or salt water over your wife. All of this cherishing is easy when you proclaim the right things. Protection number one. Put it up there. Protection number one. We find number two is provision. Number three is pleasure. Apple of your eye. Wow, she gives, my Deborah gives me pleasure. Number four. Proclaim, start speaking not what you want her to do, how you want to feel about her. And it won't be long before the feelings follow. Is anybody listening? I'm finished. I quit for tonight. Did that shock you when I quit for tonight? If God spoke to you, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. so good. I just want to make sure before we're all dismissed, into a blessed week. I'm going to dismiss you into a blessed week. I'm going to bless your week. I'm going to ask God to go before you and do great things in your life. Before that happens, I just want to make sure everybody's all right with God. So I want to ask you one question. Is it okay if I ask you a question and you answer the question in your heart? Nobody will know but you and God. Is that okay? Just answer it in your heart. But don't don't, 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 don't just stare at me. Don't do that. Answer the question. Is that okay? Here's the question. If you were to walk out of this building, head towards your car, and your heart stopped, bam, and you died, would you go to heaven? Would you go to hell? Your answer to that says a lot about where you're at. Answer it. Would you go to heaven? Or would you go to hell? Some of you said, well, I hope, Pastor, I, I hope I'd make it to heaven. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can hope your way in heaven like whoever's the greatest hoper gets to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. Is that okay? Somebody tell you the truth? Some of you might have said, well, I think. I think I'm going to go to heaven. Nowhere does it say positive thinking will get you into heaven. Nowhere. It's not going to, you're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might have said to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, you, you, you just don't understand. Pastor Jim, I, I've always thought of myself as a Christian all my life. But guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say, because you think of yourself as a Christian, you are a Christian, and you get to go to heaven and have eternal life. Nowhere. Well, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I'm really a good person. I'm going to go to heaven because I'm good. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible says you get to go to heaven because you're good. It's not in the Bible. Imagine that Hollywood and his movies say that. But nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good. You're not going to make it. Some of you need to understand the truth and what the word of God says. Listen, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Now, well, then he goes on to say these words. No man goes to the Father except by me. In other words, you can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven my way. You can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. You're not going to make it, and somebody needs to tell you. You're going to have to get to heaven. If you're going to get to heaven, and you want to get to heaven, you don't want to go to hell, then listen, you're going to have to get to heaven his way. 
And he tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the scripture, John 3rd chapter. He says these words, you must be born again. Now we immediately, when I use the word born again, everybody turns off, everybody thinks born again. People are nuts, uh, they're crazy. And that, you know why you think that? It's because Hollywood has portrayed, portrayed born again people as kind of goofy, fanatical, radical, crazy people, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. Here's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible, because you don't understand, listen to this, to the end of the Bible, here's what it means. Born again means this, as simple as this, that you have given God all of your heart, you have given God all of your life. You see, with God, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ, always has been, always will be. God forgive us in American churches, we watered that down. It's an all or nothing relationship. I'll prove it to you by the scripture. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. And he says, I'm coming again. You know he is. I, we just don't know when. But you know he is. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, he says these words, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just said? Lukewarm people are not real Christians at all. And they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. That people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all and they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. That is a crude statement Jesus just made but it's a true statement for every one of us. We need to take heed to it. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, you don't understand. I joined my last church. It was a Christian church. I was there for 14 years. I sang in the choir. I helped the pastor. I carried his Bible. I counted the offerings. I was a leader in that church. Great. Could you show me somewhere in the Bible where it says because you're a leader in the church that sang in the choir 14 years, you get to go to heaven? Could you show me that? Or you get to be born again if you do those? Not in the Bible. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, you don't understand. My mom and dad told me as a Christian when I was a kid. Well, well, well they took me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class. And you know what else they did? They had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. And I've always thought of myself as a Christian. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible, this will shock you, nowhere in the Bible to say your mom and dad can do those things gets you to go to heaven. You get to go to heaven. It is not in the Bible. I'm glad your mom and dad did those things, but that's not how you get to heaven. In order for you to get to heaven, you have to be responsible enough to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. And tonight you're in this place. You have a divine appointment with God. That's why God brought you here tonight. To give God all of your heart, to give God all of your life, stop messing around with God. That's what this is all about. You say, Pastor, well, how do I do it? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pound my Bible. I'll go, bang. When you hear that sound, bang. Your hand goes up. When I see your hand go up, what you're saying by the raising of your hand is I want to give Jesus all of my heart, give him all of my life. Well, I'm going to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. I don't want to go to hell, Pastor. I want to go to heaven, and we'll pray for you. And tonight, you can be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. But it's your call. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. Stop, stop, stop. You want me to raise my hand? If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. People I came with will see me. People behind me will see me. I'll feel funny. Uh-huh. You might feel funny. Get over it. It's better to feel funny in a safe place like this for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people see instead of what God sees. Come on. No one's that stupid. But the devil thinks you are, and he's trying to talk you out of it right now. Tonight is your night of salvation. God brought you here. This is your time to get right with God. Today is your day of salvation. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to pop my hands on this Bible. Bang. When you hear that sound, who should raise your hand? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, you know who you are. I'm talking to you. Come on. Be honest with yourself. I'm speaking to you. I love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough to tell you the truth. 
My goodness, somebody ought to do that. And you need to get right with God tonight. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, get ready to put your hand up and make sure. Tonight is your night. I'm counting to three. Are you ready? Here it is. It's your call. I've done my job. Back in the family rooms, all across this auditorium, wherever you're at, even in the foyer by television, even if you're online right now, you can get right with God right where you're at. God's watching you right there. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. And then you get your hand up and let me see it. All across this auditorium. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Thank you. Back over here. There's another one you pointed over here somewhere. Where are you on this side? They're pointing over here, but I didn't see a sign. There's eight right over there. Thank you. I see you right here. You can put your hand down. There's another one over here. Where are you, Danny? Oh, there you are. Gotcha. Eight, nine. God bless you. There's 10. Thank you. There's 11. Back over here. God bless you. Anybody else? Real quick. There's 11 really, really, really wise people that are going to go to heaven that weren't going to go a moment ago. That's good news. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 11 wise people. All right, here's what I want you to do. All 11 of you, I want you to get a hold. All 11 of you, I'm speaking to you now. If you raise your hand, you're serious about God. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Get all your stuff. Bring a friend. You're sitting next to somebody and they raise their hand and they're not coming and say, come on, I'll go with you. Or if you're sitting next to somebody, maybe they ought to come. Just tell them, come on, friend, I'll go with you. I want you to get out of your seat, get your stuff, get in the aisle, meet me in front. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on. No one leaves during this period of time. The ushers are in the foyer. They're going to beat you and slap you down if you get up and leave during this period of time. No, they won't. But guess what? Don't leave. It's rude. Here's what we want you to do. I want every single one of you that raise your hand. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Friend, get a friend if you need to. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. Now listen, if you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, you can come to get your stuff. Don't let the devil talk you out of it. You know you need to do this. And get up here in front. Who cares what anybody thinks? It's only be, going to be you and God anyway. Let's stand and welcome them as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I surrender. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. It's not like you're going to go to the morgue. You get to go to heaven. And so that's a good thing, okay? I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you with the black shirt, black coat on? His name is Pastor Joel. Joel is a great guy. No weird stuff goes on. He's going to do three things. One, he's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. Two, he's going to give you some free information to take home about what to do next. Now that you're saved... What the heck does God want me to do? Well, this information will tell you what God would have you to do next now that you're saved. Three, he's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. There are people that will help you, meet you before church service, encourage you, pray for you, call you during the week. Make sure, listen to these words, make sure you don't fall through the cracks and go back, but go on with God. Let us help you get strong in Jesus. Is that okay? You need somebody to help you get strong in Jesus. It only takes a few moments. People who came with will wait for you. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you 
in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.